When you're using an interface, how do you know what just happened from the feedback that the system provides to you? In the real world, the feedback often happens naturally. You bounce a ball, you see it come back up. But in the computational world, we're designing what it is that the user sees and hears. And it's often difficult, if you're not paying attention, to provide that good feedback. But there's several strategies for doing a good job, and it's extremely important. To start off, show what the status of the system is. If you have an interaction that happens almost immediately, a lot of the feedback is simply showing the current state. So if you've got a flow, you're just at the current state of the design. Now, how much feedback you need will depend on response time. Under a second, just show the outcome. If it takes about a second, it's useful to have some indicator of status so that you know the computer didn't just get stuck. Uh, on a web browser, for example, this is the spinning dial that, that shows up in the tab. But this could just as easily be the hourglass, or a spinning ball, or a progress icon. Anything that moves that where the pixels change on the screen so that you know that something is happening. If it takes more than a second, it's useful to have some level of progress be shown. And this could be a circular progress bar that shows up to 100%. This could be a linear progress bar. It could be a countdown timer. Once you get more than a couple of seconds, it can be useful to have an actual countdown timer. Uh, in part because users know that the progress bars don't always proceed uh, linearly with respect to time, uh, or you want to know again whether things got stuck. You know, should I go off and have lunch, or should I just wait 10 more seconds? In the late 80s, I used the very first version of Photoshop, where often uh, on an early color Mac, it could take 20 minutes for an image operation to, to happen. And so it was nice to know some operations were relatively quick, but others could take a very long time. And it really would be, you know, you'd go get lunch and come back and it would be done and then you could move forward. Same thing for time, you could show for space. So if uh, your webmail system shows you how much of your inbox you've used, that's nice because as you get close, you can start to decide to do something about it. If all of a sudden you get a surprise, you're out of space, that's really frustrating. Part of showing the system status is what are the options that are available based on what I have done. So if I close a document, it's useful for it to say, hey, you've made changes. The status of the document is that it's been changed. And you have three options. And in this dialog box here, you see how each of those names is clear with respect to what will happen. By the way, one other bit of good user interface design here that you see is that the Save button is blue which means it's the default button. Uh, it's the button that'll happen when you press the return key. Also, the Save button has three dots after it. And those three dots mean that something else will happen. So with uh, Don't Save, there's no additional dialog box. With Cancel, there's no additional dialog box. But with Save, those three dots mean click on me, and there will be another dialog where you'll further parameterize this interaction. Traffic lights. Classic example of showing state. And traffic lights show state usefully by having a redundant code. The redundant code in the case of the traffic light, that the red light up top is both red and it's up top. That can be useful for times where the color is hard to see because of lighting, or in particular for users who may be colorblind. If one of those codes is unavailable, you can always use the other. The way that feedback connects to action is that it's nice to show, after you've done an action, where you are and what the next step might be. So you sign up for a mailing list, and it doesn't just say, great, you've signed up. It actually says, OK, you've signed up. And now the next thing that you can do is this thing. And that helps move people along in the process, because people often don't know what they can do next. And of course, once something is done, to let, let you know that it's complete, for long interactions, then you want to have maybe even a dialog box that comes up. Here's a really playful one from the um, video tool called Handbrake. Good feedback can really help you prevent errors. We were looking at a save dialog box earlier. Uh, this is one that I really like. If you're about to save a file, and that file already exists, uh, this Adobe dialog box gives you four options. 
it's impressive both because you get the choices that are relevant, but also because they're named really well. So if it says, hey, this file already exists, what would you like to do? Would you like to overwrite that file? Would you like to skip writing that file for now? Would you like to cancel out of this export interaction completely? Or would you like to use unique names? So we'll give this one a dash 2.jpg at the end. One way that you can improve in a dialog box like this is we might show you a thumbnail of what that picture looks like and what your picture looks like. And here we see a dialog box that does some of uh, the work, but not enough. That the Adobe dialog box gave me a number, a number of options. Here with this Mac dialog box, it just says, hey, uh, you can't do that. And of course, what would be really nice in this Mac case is to have the options that were available to me in the Lightroom case. One impediment to good feedback is overly generic names. In the last video, uh, we talked a little bit about how speaking navigation, using more wordy links with icons, can help people know what lies beyond. Here's a dialog box with three options, which on their face seem pretty good. Would you like to save the changes you made to this presentation? We can choose Don't Save, Cancel, or Save. They seem like pretty normal options. Save clearly makes sense. It's also the default probably rightfully so. But what's the difference between don't save and cancel? I'm actually not entirely sure in this case, and I think many users wouldn't be either. If cancel here means close without saving or something like that, then we probably should have a button labeled close without saving. And if cancel here means exactly the same thing as don't save, we'll just escape you out of the dialog sequence and uh, and you go back to where you were, then we probably don't need those two different buttons. A really important part of feedback is what are the set of things that the system uh, expects or allows me to fill in. A find dialog is a classic example of something that has several parameters. So if I'm trying to find text like this and replace it with text like this, um, we've got the top part of the dialog dog box, which has the find part and then a lower section for the replacing with several options there. This is where the graphical user interface uh, starts to really shine. That in the ter terminal, uh, if you know that the find command can be used for, for finding things, um, you have to remember the syntax for what command flags you use to specify the different parts of, of finding, and that can be a real pain. Of course, in both cases, you need an ability to specify a wildcard and letting users know what kinds of wildcard and flexibility can be put into a find command can be a little bit tricky. But the graphical UI gives you way better scaffolding than the terminal does. Also, in the graphical user interface, it is difficult to make syntax errors because the physical structure of the dialog box and the things that you can type into and press mean that you can't have a, you entered something nonsensical. Whereas in a command line system, if you uh, type a flag that doesn't exist or enter in a malformed expression, it will just barf on grounds that what you tried to give me wasn't a reasonable command to give. And so a benefit of graphical user interfaces from a feedback perspective is that they omit the possibility of syntax errors. Lots of other errors can still happen, just not syntax errors. That doesn't mean that you always want to provide as many constraints as possible. Here's an example of a user interface where the constraints actually get in the way of the task rather than help. I was searching my, for my friend and colleague Dan Olson's book. So I typed Olson into this search field, and I hit Enter, hoping that it would give me a list of his books and I could select among them. However, what happens is that a list of catalogs appears. So the publisher has different catalogs, which is something that they care about, but probably you don't care about most of the time. But in this case, you need to select a catalog first before you then and go see which books contain uh, something authored by Dan Olson. And that uh, intermediary is just completely unnecessary in this context. So you want to have constraints when they help, 
and not when they hurt. And the constraints and options you offer should be ones that are uh, syntactically possible and that make sense given the particular context. Here's a calendaring interface where you can ask for a meeting time, but if you forget to fill out the days, uh, both start and end, uh, it throws up a syntax error that says, hey, you didn't specify that. It seems like it would be a lot better to either, um, if you try to hit create without specifying days, it pops up a, ca uh, a calendar widget. Or in some cases, it might make sense to have some default days that you start with, which you can then change if needed. Similarly, if there are kinds of input like the airplane doesn't fly on Thursday or the room isn't bookable on Sundays, then that probably shouldn't be an option that's available. Those should either be removed from the option set or grayed out. Good user interface design and feedback can eliminate probably 90% of user errors or even more. But there's no way you can uh, remove 100% of them. Life happens, you know, all sorts of stuff. So when errors do happen, it's important to make the problem clear so that you can help the user recover from that error. This is an error that, in my opinion, is not very helpful. Uh, it says, hey, error creating virtual directory. Um, the unknown error has the following hex code. This is a little better than it looks, because what a lot of people have figured out to do is that you take that hex code and type it into Google, and you can find information there. Uh, that w inspired a, a research project of my group on opportunistic programming, where we use the web browser as part of the programming interface. But here, uh, you could at least have a hyperlink. And gosh, if we know a little bit about what that hex code is, maybe you could give me an English language summary of what that might be. The lack of helpful feedback probably shows up more in form filling than any other task, where here's a common error that I'm sure you've all seen. It says you must fill out all the required fields. Usually, when the user gets to this point, they didn't realize that something that they uh, didn't put in wasn't required, if that triple negative makes sense. So if I'm filling out a form and I click Go, usually I either think that I've filled out everything or at least that I filled out all the stuff that I needed to, or at least that I filled out all the stuff that I knew the answer to. It's possible I missed a field, just by whatever, or misunderstood what was required or not. But simply telling me, hey, buddy, you didn't fill out all the required fields, that doesn't help. So how could you make that better? Well, one thing that you could do is you could show people what they just filled out, where you bold and highlight and make super obvious uh, hey, you can even put an arrow around the side of the screen. I need you to add your city. Great, that I can do. Uh, or um, we need you to specify your organization. If you don't have one, check this dialog box. Or alternatively, you could just say, uh, hey, we need you to fill out your city, and then inline that particular single element that's missing. So there are a number of ways that you can guide people to the specific thing that you need them the information from uh, without just saying, you didn't do it right. And this Facebook sign up shows one example of that, where here, if I try to fill in nothing, just as an example, uh, pedagogically, and click sign up, it puts a red box around all the things that I missed. It puts a big red exclamation point around them also. So we have two codes showing that. That way, I won't miss the same thing again. And it puts a big arrow by the first one that I should start out with. And so it gives me a nice on-ramp to get going. This dialog box of some files could not be created uh, is probably not something anybody wants to see. But what it does do a good job of, even if it's medicine that I probably don't want to hear, is it tells me, please do the following things. Close the applications, reboot, and then commence the uh, installation again. So it gives me a path forward. That's extremely important. For search user interfaces, sometimes when you can't find anything, uh, it's nice to know, hey, remember to check the spelling, try more general terms, use synonyms, stuff like that. This is a good uh, user interface. Without a doubt, a better user interface would be to say, uh, you typed Scott with one T. That didn't give us anything. So here's some examples of Scott with two Ts. Or you searched for a specific instance. Here's a more general instance. So if you're doing a geo search, it might automatically broaden the area that it's searching. 
or we automatically checked the synonyms. And so when the system can actually go the extra mile and check one step further along for you and show those as an examples of things that you might want, that's a great path for error recovery. Some errors or problems may be things that we don't even realize. This is the challenge of phishing on the web. Firefox and other browsers these days do a nice job of, if you go to a site that has been reported as a bad actor, even if you don't realize it, you know, Facebook with one O or something like that is a secret hacker site, it will flag that for you and say, you may not realize it, but this situation is dicey. And of course, you, you can, uh, there's a text in the lower right corner where you can say, no, no, I know what I'm doing, which is sometimes necessary to do. But the prominent stuff is, get out of here, what's going on, why am I being fished? And that's a nice, nice segue into our last heuristic, which is to provide useful help. It can be easy in a development team to think about help as somebody's problem and not part of the real app. I think we're fortunate things have gotten a lot better in recent years that web help and documents and applications have all blurred together more with the web. So it's not as bad as it used to be in the desktop software era. But still, it can be easy for help to be an afterthought, and you don't want to do that. One kind of help that I think is especially powerful, especially for technical things like programming, is to show examples. And, and PHP has done this for years. They say, OK, uh, as opposed to just giving you a dictionary of all the syntax of the language, we'll show you common ways that people use this particular function, what it gets combined with, how you set the parameters, all that stuff. It's really great. And here's an example from Adobe Lightroom, where the user is searching for information on how to expose their image, and the program provides the most relevant information, along with showing the most relevant menu path. By contrast, one kind of task that seems like it's providing information, but in fact is doing anything but, are end user license agreements. I think that the way that EULAs are treated by software today is totally morally bankrupt and certainly a usability disaster, probably even intentionally so. The problem, of course, is that when you get a giant EULA, uh, nobody's going to scroll all the way through. People don't understand most of the language. They're just trying to do something else. They don't care. And so the system disingenuously shows you this big, massive thing, forces you to click Agree. And then it's like, hey, you agreed to the terms, so we can do whatever we want now. Uh, and I think that's just crazy. And I think a much better example, like what we see here, comes from Creative Commons. And so what the uh, nonprofit Creative Commons has done is that Creating licenses is a real challenge. You know, there's a reason that there's all that text in the EULA. But that doesn't mean that people need to see all of the text all of the time. So Creative Commons has these short summaries, and then they have the much longer legalese version that explains what the short summary means for the nine people who care. Uh, and then they have a code version that makes that EULA executable. And I think that's a much more effective path forward. And I hope that all of you out there adopt that strategy for EULAs. And lastly, to end on a more positive note, uh, I think you can really help people have fun. Here's a hotel website where, as part of declaring if you have an allergy, one of the things that you can elect to rest your head on is a sympathetic shoulder. And so burying these little Easter eggs in apps can really make your site be a lot more fun and organic. And there have been a bunch of people who have done this for uh, page not found errors recently. I think every year they get more and more clever. And it's kind of a fun inside joke uh, across the web. So now you've got these 10 design heuristics in your arsenal. And you can use them to think about what designs you, you might try to be able to talk about the relative merits of different designs. I mean, these heuristics are great when you are in a design team discussion or you're talking with clients about different choices. Extremely powerful. Uh, I found them super useful in my career, and I hope you do too. Happy designing.